Greetings and welcome to our latest episode of Si Yo Fuera Una Cancion, If I Were a Song. We are a community-based podcast and radio show in which people of Santa Ana, California, tell us in their own words about the music that means the most to them. I am Elizabeth Le Guin, your program host and director of this project. I've been a musician since I was 10 years old, which makes over half a century now. I was trained as a classical cellist, and I'm currently a professor of musicology at UCLA. I live in Santa Ana, where I'm part of a community that practices Mexican traditional music. This project is based on my conviction that we people in the modern world need to learn to listen to one another, and that music is the perfect place to begin. My name is David Castaneda, music researcher here for the Si Yo Fuera Una Cancion podcast. I'm a percussionist specializing in musics from Latin America and the United States. In addition to playing these musics, I have also studied them. I recently finished my PhD dissertation in ethnomusicology, which explored the ways that musicians are listening to each other across national, cultural, and ethnic lines. I'm so happy to be a part of this project, using my training and my performance experience to bring you the stories, music, and lived experiences of those living right here in Santa Ana. So, Diana, welcome. I'm so thrilled to have you here uh, to do an interview with me. And it's for me also a chance to get to know you a little bit. Why don't we start out with you just introducing yourself as you would like our listeners to know you, to tell us your name. If you're comfortable, tell us your age. And uh, anything about what it is that you do, where you are in your life that you think will help the listeners get to know you a little bit. Yeah, so thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Diana Morales. Uh, I was originally born in Santa Cruz, Tanaco, Michoacán, and I'm currently living in Santana. So I feel like that's for me uh, where I identify as coming into Santana, being a Santanera, um, and then also having that background of coming from Michoacán. Uh, so myself now in the present, what I'm doing is mostly art. I'm a digital illustrator that makes Pura Pecha art. Uh, and that for me really is to tell more stories about who I am, more stories about where my family comes from, uh, and to be able to share share our culture. Mm. What age were you when you came to Santana? Uh, so I was about to be five years old. I don't remember much about Mexico. Uh-huh. So you have not had the opportunity to go back? No. So I'm not able to because I have DACA. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> and, of course, you mentioned Purépecha art. And tell us a little bit, if you will, about that. That That is your heritage, correct? Yeah. So Purépecha is a culture, an indigenous culture that is located within Michoacán. Um, and within this region, there's four different regions that make up Purépecha territory. And so they're, they're kind of divided and they're known as the like Lake region, um, Sierra region, uh, Valley region. Um, and there's one more region that I can't remember. <laughs> um, but those are the regions that are considered to be uh, Pura territory, and then from there, there's a lot of uh, migration that has happened either outwards into the rest of Mexico and then outwards here to the U.S. Yeah, that's right. The kind of multiple layers of migration, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Is, is forgive my ignorance, is Michoacán kind of like ground zero for the Pura Pecha people? Is, is that kind of the main concentration of, of that nation, if you will, within within Mexico? Yeah, yeah. So that would be considered our native and traditional territory. Wow. Well, I do, I hope for you that you get a chance to go back as soon as possible. Yeah, I hope so too. It's very cool that you're maintaining that connection, even though by force you, you have to stay here uh, mm-hmm. far, far from that land. Mm-hmm. Um, I've taken a little look at at your art. You have a lovely website and you have a presence on Instagram and we will be sure to link to those things uh, when your episode comes out. It's really cool what you're doing. It, so you said it's digital art, right? I, I didn't realize that, but it's it doesn't look digital in the sense that it, it looks very earthy and, how should I put it, kind of solid. And these beautiful images of, of women with with beautiful background colors. 
what kind of work do you see your art doing in this urban setting in which we are living right now? Yeah, thank you so much for the compliment. I do definitely feel that one of the main uh, figures that I try to include in my art is always mujeres, um, especially for me because there's women, Purapecha women, that I really look up to, that I really admire. Um, and that for me have been those people that I've needed, you know, to look towards for for people who are cultural bearers of Purapecha culture in here in the U.S., being so far away um, from our territorios. And so, you know, growing up in Santana, it's a very urban space. Um, there's some community gardens here, which I feel have been the place for me to um, kind of reach out to and be able to reconnect with what it what it meant for my family in the territorios to be growing uh, milpas, to be growing cempasuchil, um, all kinds of quelites. And so <laughs> I feel like my art is a way to to uh, visualize all of that um, traditional ways of growing, growing semillas. And some of those semillas do come with us. Like those are seeds that we bring with us through migration. Um, and so I like to think that our traditional ways aren't ending. They're not um, necessarily endangered. Um, there's a lot of ways that we try to preserve that. That's right. And uh, yeah, so, so many neat things in what you're saying there. You're referring to the what's often called the granjita, right? Here in Santana. Yes. If you'd like to know a little bit more about La Granjita, Listen to episode 10. In that episode, Elizabeth talks to Abel Ruiz, who runs the Santa Ana Granjita, and explains the human importance of gardens and the tensions between idealism and safety. You know, just that the idea of seeds, of semillas, uh, the way they, every semilla, it carries a plant inside of it, you know, that will, under the right conditions, it will, it will grow and flourish and become new life. And I mean, what a wonderful metaphor for the whole idea of migration. Mm -hmm. That, you know, seeds are like portable, right? They're super portable, most of them. And, and, And they can go to all kinds of places. And if the conditions are right, they'll grow and they'll take root and they'll make this new ecosystem. And, and that's a lot like what happens when people migrate and bring their culture with them. Yes. It's very cool that you're bringing that forward in your art and in and, and, and what you do. I, I admire it a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's go to the first of the two songs that you shared with me. Uh, the, one, the one that is expressing or representing in some way where you come from, which is a, a phrase that is deliberately a bit a bit open and vague, like where do you come from? That can mean geography, but it it can also mean culture, it can mean state of mind. So if you will just tell us a little bit about this song, what what its name is, and then we'll listen to it. (laughs) Okay, Um, so the first song that for me reminds me so much about where I'm from is this song called Adios California. And so the literal translation is Goodbye, California. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And so I chose this song because this is a song that I grew up hearing all of the time, like literally every Sunday. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And so what this song basically is saying is that um, it's talking in the perspective of someone who is Pura Picha. Um, and has migrated out to California and then for some unexpected reason has to leave California and go back to to their pueblo. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is a song that I grew up always hearing and it reminds me of my parents' experience, right? Because for them, um, they've always told me that they have plans of someday going back um, to their pueblos after after we're all graduated from college, after we all have jobs and we're steady, um, that is the, the hope to one day return uh, back to the Pueblo. And so this song being present, you know, throughout all of my life, um, I think it's a song that many, many Pura Picha folks who are out here in the diaspora recognize. Um, yeah, and it's a beautiful song. Okay, let's listen to it. 
Adiós California, adiós California, ya me voy de aquí. Amigos, yo no sé si vuelva nuevamente aquí. De que yo regreso, de que yo regreso, no lo sé. So, they don't sound too unhappy about leaving California. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they don't. It's actually a very, uh, very happy song, and I heard it a lot too. Uh, during the fiestas that we would do here in Santana. And so it was a, a song that when everybody near you, you have to go out and dance it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so you mentioned, uh, before we played it, you mentioned that this, this song is a little bit of an anthem for the Purepecha community here. And I know there is such a community in the LA area. And maybe you could tell us a little bit more just kind of about... Uh, is is Santana a, a major center for for the Purépecha diaspora here, or is it in another part of LA? So, from what I know, is that uh, between Santana and LA, uh, there has been documented about 700 families that are part of the Purépecha diaspora, and then specifically in Santana and Costa Mesa is where you can find uh, folks that come from the pueblo that I come from in Santa Cruz Tanaco. And so it is known uh, back in the Pueblo that Santana is one of the cities that we come and migrate to. Um, and then other places that I also know of are, for example, up in Salinas, uh, which is a, a strawberry growing field. And so that's also one of the main uh, reasons that folks migrate out uh, into, into the central coast of California for, for farm worker jobs. Right. Oh, man, picking strawberries, I am do told, and I can well imagine, is one of the hardest forms of field labor because they're down so low, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're bent over the whole time. So, yeah, I could imagine leaving a job like that behind. <laughs> and being happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another part that's within the song is the that the, the singer is saying that he received a letter Um, and that that's the reason that he has to go back to his pueblo. And so sometimes, too, um, that can be interpreted as uh, someone who's out here in the U.S. receiving a letter from a family member that, for example, a relative is dying. Um, and so that's also something that I think about a lot and some conversations, you know, that I've had within my own family of uh, folks that they miss, uh, friends who they haven't seen in the longest time, Or even like our my grandmother, I only have one maternal grandmother who's living, and then one great grandmother on my dad's side who's living. Um, and so I also think about that, like what news would be so so drastic that would make us uh, want to immediately leave uh, and be a reason to go. Right, right, and it would be drastic news, wouldn't it? Because. Uh If you left, you couldn't come back. Mm -hmm. It would it would mean really just essentially dropping your life. And yes, yeah, that is a that's a condition that many people that I know here in Santana and in, in the south part of California, you know, live with this every day. And mm -hmm. it, it's interesting. I have enjoyed freedom of movement across borders all my life until the last year and a half when a global pandemic made that very difficult and in many cases impossible. And it's just a funny thing that although many of my friends are undocumented and it's an issue that I take very seriously and have strong feelings and opinions about, I don't think I ever really knew in my heart what it felt like until I realized that I could not go and visit my daughter who lives in Canada. Uh, that that actually was not an option, even if she were having a, a really bad time or or in danger of death or something, I would not have been able to visit her. And and that when I realized that uh, it was one of the strongest moments in the in the pandemic for me was realizing ah, okay, now I get a little taste of what so many of my friends and and acquaintances live with every day. It's it's been a 
a teacher in that way, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of changes that need to happen and changes waiting to happen for the longest of times. Yes, indeed. Well, and but then this song, which is extremely, extremely animated and cheerful. Uh, and, and that's something that I, I deeply admire is, is the way out of this situation that is really not a good situation in so many ways that these musicians and, it, and in fact, a, a whole culture just pulls good cheer and buen animo and, you know, and let's, let's be happy because this is what we got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I love that it's a it's an em- embracing of the sadness, and yet also the joy that would come with um, realizing that you might be able to go back to your pueblo. Yeah, so it's a complexity. Nothing is just all bad, and nothing is all just good. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, that song kind of on the face of it, it sounds like very simple music, and and very simple lyrics. But you're absolutely right. It's not simple at all. The what it's what it's about is really, really complex. Yeah, that's very cool. So, yeah, we're agreed, I think, that there are a lot of important things that really need to change. And that sort of, um, that starts to turn our thoughts a little bit toward the future, where those changes might actually take place, and, and maybe the question of how those changes might take place. And the second song that I asked you to pick uh, speaks to those kinds of questions. I, uh, I asked my interviewees to pick a second song that represents or expresses their hopes for the future. So you want to tell us a little bit about what you chose in that category? Yeah, so for the second song uh, about hope and uh what I would wish for the future, I chose this song, Creo en Ti, by Ana Tijoux. Um, and so Ana Tijoux is a Chilean artist uh, that I feel a lot of folks within the movement, uh, many mo- movements here in the U.S. know. Um, and I would say, too, it's a song that gives us animals uh, in machas, animals. Um, we might feel that the things we are doing are not enough, uh, but there's definitely changes that are happening uh, when we continue to do this work. Um, and so for me, I feel like Anna is someone who, with her words, just truly hits home, <laughs> um, pulls strings of my heart. There's songs that when I first heard about her, when I first heard some of her songs, I'd just be in tears because just everything that she was saying, um, I feel I feel deeply. Um, and I also think that as an artist, she's someone who embraces so much of uh, imagination and claiming like the first lyrics that that are part of this song is simply creo en lo imposible. Uh, so I believe in the impossible, and I feel like for me that that's me. <laughs> um, and then within my art, that's definitely something that I feel I'm trying to do. Um, you know, depict these illustrations that are about joy. Um, depict illustrations that honor honor my the woman within my family um uh, folks who are out here continuing to do the work resisting in any way that they do um you know sometimes it isn't marching and putting their lives at risk sometimes it's simply uh preserving language um and doing little things like uh cooking traditional foods uh, and continuing to maintain those uh, relationships of community, even out here. Um, and so I feel like this song from Anna is very much uh, about believing in what we might think is impossible. And it, it's not. Um, I also really love the other phrase uh, that says, Creo en lo imposible, que de nuestras espaldas brotarán las alas. Like that, I, be- I believe. <laughs> I truly believe that there's um, magic happening within within ourselves and uh, within the spaces of community that are super healing um, and that make us uh, regain the energy and the ganas to just keep going. Yeah. Oh, well, what a beautiful introduction. Let's listen to the song. En lo pequeño radica la fuerza, con tu cariño yo caminaré. Imaginando rutinas bellas para dar vuelta al mundo al revés. Empezando... 
Empezar por nuestra casa primero Romper con todo nuestro miedo Ser consecuente de cuerpo y de mente Para alzar el vuelo por senderos nuevos Porque tu luz cotidiana Enciende la sonrisa que sale por la mañana Creo en ti Porque veo tu fuerza inexplicable This is not the first time that you've heard about Ana Tiju here on Si Yo Fuera Una Canción. Marla Sanchez also spoke about the importance of this artist and the meaning of Tiju's music in Marla's life and for many communities here in Santa Ana. All of this and more can be heard in episode 12. Yeah, this is a super hopeful song, but it's like really... Uh... I don't know, there's different kinds of hope, right? And sometimes hope can be a little bit sort of blind or, or not, you know, you, you hope about things without thinking about them too much because if you think about them too much, it's not doesn't feel very hopeful. <laughs> but but this, <laughs> this is not that kind of song. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Ana Tiju is somebody who clearly thinks about things a lot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you mentioned how her words just go straight to your heart. I, I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> she chooses them well. And, yeah, d tell, tell me a little bit. So the, you know, the refrán de la canción, Creo en ti, I believe in you. Um, how, does, how does that transformation work where, uh, where by believing in someone else, you believe in, your, in yourself? Hmm. Oof. So I feel like, well, going back to why why I chose this song, I feel like it's a song that came into my life definitely as I was mm, immersing into the activism world um, and just kind of learning a lot of the histories of imperialism, of colonialism, and that being something that I had never, ever known of, you know, high school education does not teach you that. No, it does not. Um, <laughs> Uh, so for me, it wasn't until after college that that I started to really ask those questions, and that I started to to almost um, immerse into this political identity of being indigenous, of being migrant, um, to you know say undocumented, unafraid. Those movements of almost letting go of fear. I feel like that song was present throughout all that time, uh, all that time of transition for me in, in my college years. Um, and so thinking of the song, I also think of, you know, movements uh, within the US, um, in Latin America that are, are fighting against the imperialism that is still very much present um, and trying to destroy communities. Um, and so for me, this song was something that I could really hold on to. Um, and, and yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's, a, there's an interesting thing going on here. I want, I, let me see if I can get at it with you. Um, mm -hmm. there's identity politics where mm -hmm. people go out in the world and they try to make changes that reflect better uh, the needs of a group that they identify with. Mm -hmm. So this can, can take a, a lot of different forms, right? Uh, and one of them it has to do with ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a kind of a, a view out there, I would say, that identity politics has the potential to divide us even more. And we are a pretty badly divided country already. But this is what you're talking about. It's the opposite of that. You know, uh, I, I believe in you and therefore I believe in me. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's an activism that is based on, I guess, empathy. Would that be the right word? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you see that as being a, like a particularly indigenous kind of activism or how, how does that work for you? Yeah, I mean, I feel like for me, I didn't start to see it in that way. Um, until I started being an organizer, until I started um, to go out and join marches um, and feel that I was safe within community. 
um, and to feel that, you know, we were there collectively for a reason to hold on to that dignity. Um, and so again, I feel like being growing up in Santana, you, you're bound to come across uh, a lot of organizing collectives. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, that's where I, I first started to, to, again, learn this history um, and then ask questions about, well, where was I coming from and what were the, those stories that, that I still had that needed to be preserved? Um, Las historias no contadas, right? That's what um, Anati just says. Um, and so I definitely questioned that a lot. Um, and then this phrase of creo en ti, definitely, I, I feel it like Ana telling me, but also like myself telling all the folks that I've come across that I've built community with. Um, you know, I believe in you. I feel safe with you. Um, I feel like I can count on you. Um, and so part of like my experience within community organizing in Santana has been very much um, what I've talked about in the past is this cultura of, um, of helping each other out. And I definitely, definitely feel like that has roots um, within practices that are indigenous, uh, where a lot of folks are migrating from. Because there's so many uh, uh, places that folks are coming from um, and into Santana, and some of it is Pura Picha, some of it isn't. Um, and so now, in at this time, at this time in my life, um, I feel like this creo en ti has also become uh, within my own family of trying to to have that belief in, in us that we can still do a lot more, even if it isn't uh, being out in marches, because that's, for example, that's something that's not safe for my parents. Right. Um, and so I think about the different ways that we can resist uh, without having to put ourselves so much in danger in the face of danger. Um, and so those ways do look like, like I was saying, you know, uh, preserving our language. Um, I see that as a major way of resisting. Um, I see the work that I do of making art and preserving joy, of preserving uh, this orgullo, uh, of recognizing who we are, uh, making our existence visible. Um, that's another another way of resisting. And so I feel like after a long journey of, you know, being in the movement, organizing, um, feeling fear, fear at marches uh, with police presence and all that stuff, um, I feel like that was hard. That was really hard. And it's hard to do um, if you don't feel like you have community there for you. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, I would I would think it'd be almost impossible to do with without that you know, somebody respaldando a ti. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you said so many wonderful things. And I'm I'm actually looking at the the lírica de la canción and she says, Yo vine a compartir con quien haya entendido que la pelea empieza por el nido. Mm -hmm. And here's a translation of those lines. I came to share with those who have understood that the fight begins with the nest. I take that to mean the fight begins at home. Uh, which sounds kind of like what you were just saying, that, you know, activism can take a lot, a lot of different forms. And getting out in the streets and marching is, is one, but it's only one. Mm -hmm. And... Staying at home and cooking amazing food <laughs> could could be another one, right? <laughs> yes. And and then there's also the language thing, which I think is is super interesting. That so your parents do they do they speak Purépecha in the home? Yeah, yeah. So they both that's their uh, native language, and then they learned Spanish later on in their life. Um, uh -huh. And then for me, I grew up speaking Spanish. Uh, hearing Pura at home, but not really practicing the response. So mm. I'm like half, half. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A so-called heritage speaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then there's English, and we're having this interview in English. <laughs> yes. And it's, you know, it's, and it's 
a crazy, lovely mix. And the whole proposito of, of this show is we, we keep it bilingual and mm-hmm. we do translate every single interview, which is literally twice as much work. And that's just two languages. And then, of course, there's all these other languages. What What is the fig- figure in in Mexico? It's like, like there are 87 different language groups, indigenous language groups, just in Mexico alone that mm-hmm. are still be- being spoken, you mm-hmm. know, on a day-to-day basis. Right. Well, I got that figure wrong. The number of indigenous languages spoken in present-day Mexico is not 87. It's a mere 68. Still an astonishing figure. Purépecha is number 15 on that list in terms of numbers of speakers. There's about 150,000 people speaking that language as their principal language right now in Mexico. And that number, interestingly, is growing, a rate of about 20% since 2005. And I like to think that the healthy state of the Purépecha language is in part due to migration. Radio Santa Ana, which broadcasts our show every two weeks, has a program, I think it's weekly, in Purépecha. It's called La Hora Purépecha con Aguanita Zamora. That is the Purépecha Hour with Aguanita Zamora. And if you want to check that out, you can listen to it at radiosantaana.org. It's it's incredibly rich and yeah, and stories come out different when you tell them in a different language. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And they and they come out different uh, when you tell them in a different medium too. So you, your storytelling is is in the imagery direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So part of the reason that I do a lot of uh, pictures uh, and images is because. Uh, so since I don't know how to write out our language, um, and then that being first, because our language isn't a written language, it's an oral language. Right. Um, and so I feel like the images that I'm creating are also in reference to a lot of the ways that we would hold language through, um, for example, carvings, uh, pictografias. Uh, there's a lot of amazing designs that we have within our clothes. Um, within like clay, clay artesanías that we still have, wood carvings. There's so, so many ways that, that, that we would share what, uh, what we believed in our language. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, how cool. Well, I, I hope we can, maybe you can help me find some nice images that we can get onto our website, uh, just connected with this interview. I'd, I'd love to you know, just be able to use it as a little bit of a platform for that. Yeah, I'll share some images with you. And that would be wonderful. So just one one more question about, it's actually a question about both songs. So mm-hmm. I know that there is Purépecha music. How do those kinds of sounds, as you know them or remember them, do, do they turn up at all in either of the either of the songs that you chose? Are there, are there things that are going on in the sounds of these songs that kind of take you, uh, sonically speaking, into this world? Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like the first one, um, the first song was written by Vanda Sirawen, which is also a pueblo in, in Michoacán. And so that uh, sound of baile, uh, that I feel like is always a call. Like it's always something that that I recognize as home, um, and so that's also part of why I chose this song because just hearing these songs on the weekends, growing up, um, that always felt like home. And it's something that I wouldn't hear after I would leave my home, for example, school or like being with friends and um, other public spaces. And it and it always was something that was like a sound of being home. That is so cool. Yeah, so el mero ritmo, just just like th- that yes. particular rhythm that that song has. Would it have a particular name to it, do you think, as a dance? Um, I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure. Uh, but I do know that these songs are pirequas, <laughs> um, and then the singers are pireris. <laughs> uh, and so there has been folks who have done a little more research about the ways that certain instruments 
uh, sound would sound like traditional instruments like flutes um, and different kinds of drums that we would use in the past. Yeah, yeah. So, Pirequas, um, as I've come to understand it, a Pirequa refers to any music that is sung. Okay. Um, and instrumental music in Purépecha traditions seems to, to come in two basic speeds, which are slow and fast. And you can have slow instrumental music. When it's instrumental, it's called a son. When it's sung, it's called a pirequa. Mm-hmm. You can have fast instrumental music, which is called an alajeño. And when it's sung, it's called a pirequa. What I would like to do now with you, David, is uh, just skim the barest surface of this very rich musical tradition and listen to a couple of selections. And uh, let's just talk to each other a little bit about what we're hearing. We are outsiders to this musical tradition, um, but it's quite wonderful and brings, I think, many, many, many things for us to talk about. Uh, it's called Abajeño para todos los que quieren bailar. That is, it's an abajeño for everyone who wants to dance. To the point, I like it. <laughs> and it's played by the Gran Banda de Chan Michoacán. <laughs> you're hearing there so i think the first thing that really stands out to me is this six eight rhythm right this rhythm underneath it's triplet triplet one two three one two three one two three one two this is very very common um in the americas i would say central america you hear it in mexican mariachi and the guitarron the same type of thing you hear it in banda and lots of banda you hear this kind of rhythm um and it's just it's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful rhythm. It's very driving. It's uh, música alegre, very um, upbeat music. I forgot how to say alegre in English for some reason. I don't, I don't know if there's a direct translation, but very upbeat music. I don't think there's a translation. Yeah, it's its own word. Alegre. Yeah. 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 It, and something that I note is, is you, yeah, you've got this one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, six, you know, so hence the six in the term six, eight. But in this particular song, it like it goes for a while, and then there's a little pause, and then it goes again, and then there's a little pause, and and I'm just thinking, por todos los que quieren bailar, all who wish to dance. It's like how courteous that is, because that would be a pretty pretty fast rhythm to keep going with your feet while dancing. That one two three four five six one two three four five six, that would be difficult to do. So it's giving you little breathing spaces along the way. <laughs> But uh, obviously, the dancers would need to know the song well enough to coordinate with it. Mm-hmm. So we're not talking about we're not talking about a simple situation here. Or maybe they would do what I would do, which is basically just stumble, stumble around the dance floor, around the thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's listen to a second, very different selection, also Purépecha music. Um, so this is this is a son that is it's slow. Uh, but it is also a pirequa, that is, it is sung. Well, I would almost have said that that was a valse, except there's something about it that is not valse-like. Um, it's so interesting. It's It's got a kind of a lilt to the rhythms that is all its own. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's, uh, it's more of this 
very particular way of approaching a 6-8, right? This da ti da 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 or one, two, three, one, which is typical in, in waltzes. But then you have this, um, I guess we could call polyrhythm going on, where it goes ba ti da ti da ti da ti So it's moving from three to four at the same time, right? Which is, you don't hear that in waltzes, but you do hear that in indigenous musics, right? So indigenous musics of the new world in Central America. You hear a lot of this, right? So there's this con constant switching back and forth. It's, uh, it's fascinating and it's, it's very, very Central American as I hear it. So interesting and it's so engaging. I mean, the music is not rhythmically simple, not at all. And, and then, of course, you have a sweetness and a richness that comes when you have two voices that are just singing in this very fluid vocal harmony all the way through a song. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful. It's, yeah, really beautiful. It's true. And, uh, you know, d taking it back to Diana's first song, the Adios California, that, that song is serving a different function, I would say. Clearly, from the title alone, you know that this is music for migrants. And yet you can also, I think, hear some of the connections, at least that's our hope here. Uh, it's all part of a big, big complex, which we can only just touch on here. But just to give a little sense of, of the richness of that musical world, uh, that is Pura Picha music. Diana, so we're we're getting toward the last part of our interview, and just in in the spirit of you know looking toward the future and hopes for the future, I I learned as uh, we were setting up this interview that you are about to begin your studies at UCLA, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And what area will you be studying in? So I'm going to be part of the TEP program, the teacher education program. Uh, and so I'll be in the ethnic studies pathway. So in two years, I will be in the LAUSD district teaching ethnic studies. Um, and so that's something that I am really pursuing with all of my heart. Um, you know, like I mentioned throughout this, this whole talk, learning the true history, um, and learning the Islas Historias No Contadas is mm. the reasons why I'm going into this program. Um, and a lot of the history is also history that I'm bringing in from my family, um, from oral tradition that isn't written down, that isn't in the books, um, and that can also definitely be told through art. And must be told. Yes. Yeah. What, what age of kids do you plan to teach? Um, hopefully high school. Yeah, they're hard cases. <laughs> it's, that's a tough, that's a tough line of work. But I agree with you. That's at that age is when I think history and the ways that we tell history or histories, I should say, because it's always mm -hmm. a plural. You know, that's where it really, really becomes important. Um, yeah. Well, congratulations to you for that. That is, that is so exciting. I, I'm, I'm excited for those kids, you know, <laughs> two years down the road that to be getting a teacher like you who is um, going to be just blowing open this whole idea that history is a single thing with a capital H. <laughs> uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, we got to we really got to explode that because it does damage on so many levels. And and I, as a historian, uh I just, I just believe that, that this kind of change, changing the narrative, like you're saying, you know, that that's, mm -hmm. it's fundamental. It's fundamental. So good for you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And welcome to UCLA. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this has been a lovely interview, and I've really enjoyed getting to know you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Um, likewise, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I really hope that the folks that this reaches out to, maybe some of them are Pura Picha youth, uh, that they reach out uh, and want to have more conversations about what this experience is like being a part of the Pura Picha diaspora. Um, and yeah.
I'm here. That's that's very cool. This is a podcast principally, but we do broadcast on Radio Santana. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, so that, you know, is a little bit more accessible for some people. So hopefully through one of these media, uh, yeah, we'll be reaching out to young people like yourself who are telling new stories. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Diana. Would you like to know more? On our website at ciofuera.org, you can find lyrics to the songs we discuss, our blog about the issues of history, culture, and politics that come up around every song, links for listeners who might want to pursue a theme further, and some very cool imagery. You'll also find playlists of all the songs from all the interviews to date, and our special staff-curated playlist as well. We invite your comments or questions. Contact us at our website or participate in the Cio Fuera conversation on social media. We're out there on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And then there's just plain old word of mouth. If you like our show, do please tell your friends and your families to give it a listen. And do please subscribe on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll bring you a new interview every two weeks on Friday mornings. Julia Alanis, Cynthia Marcel de la Torre, and Wesley McClintock are our sound engineers. Zoe Broussard and Laura Diaz hold down the marketing. David Castaneda is music researcher. Deaneira Garcia and Alex Dolvan make production possible. We are a not-for-profit venture currently and gratefully funded by the John Paul Simon Guggenheim Foundation. For now, and until the next interview, keep listening to one another. I'm Elizabeth Le Guin, and this is Si Yo Fuera Una Canción, If I Were a Song. Si yo fuera una canción, sonarían por las calles, las montañas y los valles, mi orgullo y mi pasión. ¿Quién soy yo de corazón? Soy una ola, soy una onda, una vibración que ronda por el universo vivo. Y sonando soy testigo a nuestra unidad más honda.